Over the past several weeks, we have focused our attention on what the Bible says about our adversary, Satan. And as we wrap up this study, I, I want to draw some conclusions about the devil and what we can do about it. And then we will open up for questions that you may have on this subject. In our opening message, we considered the creation of Satan. And we first saw that Satan is a factual being. Despite the growing numbers of Americans who do not believe he exists, the devil is depicted as very real in the pages of Scripture. The, New, the Old Testament calls him by name in three different books. He's alluded to in others. Every New Testament writer mentions Satan. Jesus refers to Satan 25 times in the Gospels. So either Satan really exists or Jesus and the Bible are liars. So we conclude he is a factual being. We also saw that Satan is a finite being. He is not a rival with God. We know that he is at war with God, but it's not like they are two superpowers and we're just hoping the good guys win. Satan is not even close to being in the same category as God. He is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. He is not everywhere present as God is. He had a beginning, so he's not eternal as God is. So we don't have to just cross our fingers and hope that God prevails. Satan is no match for the Almighty. At the beginning, however, Satan was a fabulous being. We saw that he was originally called Lucifer. He was created initially as an angel of God. And he was beautiful. He was magnificent. He was at that point in time, the greatest creation God had made. He may have been, along with Michael, one of the archangels. And I believe that we read about him in Isaiah chapter 14. Verse 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. That's where Lucifer comes from. We also read in Ezekiel 28 about how Lucifer fell from his position in heaven. He tried to rebel against God and, and was, was kicked out. He was magnificently and majestically created, but something happened to change that. And that's where we went in our next message, the corruption of Satan. We really dug into Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Revelation 12. Things began to unravel with Satan's overconfident demeanor. In a word, pride led to his fall. In his arrogance, he decided to take on Almighty God. He thought, I'm going to wrest control from the Creator. I am going to be in charge. As part of Satan's overreaching defiance, he convinced one-third of the angels to join him, according to Revelation 12.4. But in the ensuing battle, we saw Satan's overwhelming defeat, his expulsion from heaven to earth. And since the scriptures seem to indicate that he was indeed cast to the earth after his rebellion failed, it is safe to conclude that this rebellion took place sometime after Genesis 1-1, when God created the heavens and the earth. We don't know exactly when that was in that period of time, but since the serpent appears in chapter 3, tempting Eve and then Adam, we can surmise that it had to have been somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 3-1. My suggestion is that it was recorded in Genesis 1-2, the second verse of the Bible, where it says, 
Now the earth was formless and void. And that word was in the Hebrew can also be translated became formless and void. Darkness, darkness covered the deep. It seems like God's creation on earth was, was chaos, confusion, and darkness. And later in the Old Testament, it says God didn't create it that way. So what would have caused that? Could have been Satan and his fallen angels being cast to the earth and the disruption that that would have made. Now, while Satan was decisively defeated in his initial rebellion, he is still fighting the forces of God today. We live in a perpetual battlefield, and the great spiritual war of the ages continues to rage. But don't be afraid. Satan is a defeated foe, and he's not going to come back and defeat God. All the times he tries to attack, he is going to lose. All the power and the authority of Jesus resides in us. So there's really no need to fear Satan. He is defeated. Next, we considered the character of Satan. And central to his character is his arrogance. Pride is conceit. It is uh, inordinate self-esteem. It's an inflated view of one's own importance power and opinion. It's an exaggerated view of one's own worth or ability. And it was Satan's arrogance that led to that unsuccessful mutiny against God. We also noticed Satan's ambition. Now, ambition in and of itself is not wrong. But when ambition is all about selfish gain and self-promotion, then it's wrong. When it's all about me, it becomes selfish, and and God does not like that kind of ambition. And even though he was defeated and kicked out of heaven, Satan still believes he can win. His arrogance, his ambition have clouded his reasoning. He really knows better, but he's still so bent on defeating God and defeating God's purposes that he just continues on. And because of his arrogant ambition not being realized, we still contend with Satan's anger and animosity. He hates God. He hates everything about God, including those who follow God. Revelation 12 demonstrates how his anger and his hatred flow from God himself to the Son of God who was sent to earth, to the people of God, and to individuals who follow Jesus. Until he is finally cast into hell, Satan will vent his anger and animosity on anyone he can. So that's what we know about the character of Satan. Then we moved on to the craftiness of Satan. And we began that study by pointing out the limits put on Satan. Namely, he cannot kill us, because if he could, he would. (laughs) Furthermore, he cannot make us sin. So how do we know that? Well, we know the first one because of what happened with Job. Satan goes to God and challenges God. Oh, if you would take away your hedge of protection, you know, Job would curse you to, to your face. And God allowed Satan to take away his possessions and allowed Satan to to take away even his health. But he says, you cannot take away his life. He drew a line in the sand and said, you can't do that, Satan. I won't let you do it. He does not have that power. He'd like to. He just can't do it on his own. And he also cannot make us sin. He can tempt us. He's really good at that. In fact, we get into his craftiness, and and he can be very, very uh, beguiling and deceiving. But he cannot make us sin. That's a choice that only we can make. We see in both Peter and James' letters, Christians are to resist the devil. And when we do so in the name and the power of Jesus, he must flee. 
He cannot control us. He cannot kill us. Those are the limits put on Satan. Yet we can still fall prey to the lies propagated by Satan. Just like Eve did in the Garden of Eden. We saw from Genesis 3 how the serpent used doubt, denial, and deception to tempt Eve to sin. Something he couldn't make her do, but got her to do herself. We also saw how Genesis 3.6 parallels 1 John 2.16. 1 John says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then you go back and read in Genesis 3.6, When the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, the lust of the flesh, pleasing to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom, there's the pride of life. Here we see Satan's three favorite ways to tempt us. It looks good, it feels good, and it makes us look good. You break that down into virtually every temptation to sin we encounter is going to be about one of those three things. Or a combination of them. Here it was all three. And then we looked at the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Remember that? And what were those temptations? Satan tempted him to turn stones into bread. Why? Because he was hungry. There's the lust of the flesh. He took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I'll give you all of this if you'll bow down and worship me. The lust of the eyes. They took him to the top of the temple and said, why don't you jump down and let the angels catch you and you'll make a big spectacle of yourself. They'll be blown away. The pride of life. That's how Jesus tempted Eve. It's how he tempted Jesus and it's how he tempts us today. You can look for those those three things are usually how he tries to allure us into sin. But we can see by how Jesus responded to those temptations, the lessons presented about Satan. Understand, Satan's going to hit us where we're most vulnerable. When he tempted Jesus to turn those stones into bread, Jesus hadn't eaten in 40 days. He was really hungry. And Satan will hit us right at our weakest areas. But we learn from Jesus that if we reply with the truth of God's word. Every time Jesus replied by saying, it is written, it is written, he used the truth to combat Satan's lies. And that's something that we can do as well when we are faced with his temptations. Our next study was called The Conduct of Satan. We focused on what he's doing now, not just what he did back in the Bible times, but what is he doing right now? We first considered Satan's attacks, particularly on godly leaders. His attacks are meant to intimidate us into fear. And we talked about how he was a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> he himself isn't all that scary, but he makes himself up to be something bigger than he is and tries to intimidate us. Through temptation, Satan allures us into sin, damaging our relationship to God and to others and crippling our reputation so that our testimony is not as effective. Then when we do fall into sin, Satan accuses us and he tries to use shame and guilt and fear and anger to keep us from living for God. We talked about how there's a difference between the true guilt that the Holy Spirit uses to convict us when we sin and the false guilt the devil uses. And the big difference is you can do something about true guilt. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, we can, we can repent of it, we can ask forgiveness, we can seek to make restitution, and it can be resolved. Satan will try to get us to feel guilty about something somebody else did, not even our responsibility, and we can't do anything about it. 
He'll try to get us to feel guilty about something that has already been forgiven. It's already gone, but he keeps bringing it up. Or he makes us feel guilty for trying to meet someone else's standards other than God that are probably unrealistic to begin with. Might even be our own. But that's what Satan does. That, that's his conduct. He tries to, to attack us. He tries to allure us. He tries to accuse us. And we need to be aware of our adversary. We must be armed against him. Because the only way he wins is when we let him. That's one thing we should remember about this whole study on Satan. He only wins when we let him. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we never need to lose to Satan. But if we do, it's because we let it happen. And then finally, we looked at the culmination of Satan as presented in the book of Revelation. We began in Revelation 12 with Satan's terrible carnage. We saw how uh, Revelation 12 gives us a kind of a picture of what happened in the beginning when he rebelled against God and swept one third of the stars from the sky, which I believe refer to the angels. Um, talks about how he is the accuser of the brothers. He's accusing us night and day before God. And how in the future he is going to be kicked out of heaven one last time. Even though he lost his place in heaven initially, he's still been allowed to go up to heaven and, and make his accusations and, and do all that stuff. But there's going to come a time where he makes one final assault on heaven. He is defeated. He's cast out. He's thrown to the earth. And it says in the scripture, you know, woe to the world because Satan knows his time is short. And we saw how, you know, he's tried to defeat God. He tried to devour God's son. Uh, he's tried to uh, destroy the church. None of that works. So then we're told that he goes against the children of her offspring, those who are faithful in their testimony to Jesus. These are Christians. And sometime in the future, through the devilish work of the Antichrist or the beast, as he's known in Revelation and the false prophet, he is going to declare war on Christians. And he's going to be successful in putting a lot of them to death. But before they can completely wipe out the church, I believe Jesus appears in Revelation 14 and takes the church away, what is often called the rapture. And following that, we see God pouring out his wrath on the followers of Satan. Once uh, the children of God are removed, you see the wrath being poured out in Revelation 15 through 18. And then in chapter 19, Jesus returns to earth. He comes all the way back to the surface of the earth. He's riding a white horse. The armies of heaven are following him, and I think we're part of that. And at that time, he takes the Antichrist and the false prophet. They are cast alive into the lake of fire. First two residents of hell, the Antichrist and the false prophet but not Satan. Satan is not cast into hell at this time. Instead, we see in Revelation 20 of Satan's temporary confinement. This is in the abyss or the bottomless pit, depending on what translation you have. The Greek term is Tartarus. It's a holding cell. And we're told that Satan is going to be bound there for a thousand years while Jesus rules on earth as king. But at the end of that reign, Satan is loosed for a short time during which he gathers all of the unbelievers on the earth to march against God and his son, King Jesus. Before they can attack, though, God intervenes and wipes them all out with fire. Now Satan is captured and he is cast into the lake of fire to join the Antichrist and the false prophet. This is Satan's timeless condemnation. He will be there forever and ever and ever. Tragically, all those who rejected Christ will similarly 
be cast into the lake of fire to join him. So that's an overview of our study about the adversary. Uh, I know I've covered a lot in a short period of time, uh, but I want to open it now for questions that you might have. Maybe we're brought up by one of these studies or, or something maybe we didn't touch on because I know I haven't said everything there is to say about the devil. Does anybody have a question? Okay. 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 All right. Yes. I was counting on it. Good. Yes. Yes. That is correct, yes. Correct. Is there anything anywhere in the Bible about that? Or is that just a passing sentence? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, when Satan initially rebelled against God and was cast to the earth, we actually do read about that in Isaiah and Ezekiel, those two passages refer to Satan being cast to the earth. Are there any other scriptures that would speak of the other angels being cast with him? And the answer to that is Revelation 12. Uh, Revelation 12, 4, it says the dragon swept with his tail one third of the stars and flung them to the earth. I understand it's a matter of interpretation. I do believe that's referring to the angels who joined him in the rebellion and that were cast out with him to the earth. And the fact that there were one third of the angels, that's a lot. You know, we're never told how many angels God created, but it was a bunch. And one out of three went with Satan. So it gives you an idea of how large an army he has. Now, God has twice as many as he does. Uh, and even beyond that, God doesn't need the angels to fight his battles. I mean, God could do that himself. Um, but it still shows that it, it was a pretty sizable number of, of angels that fell with Satan. And did they have any uh, knowledge of the power? Yes. Yes. Did the other angels, were they, they were just like foot soldiers? Okay, right. Uh, the question is about those other angels. Um, since Satan, as Lucifer, had a very high position, uh, what about the other angels? I don't believe they were in the, quite as powerful and as intelligent as Satan. Satan seemed to be a higher class of angel. Uh, but... Even the fallen angels are powerful, and, and they, they are destructive. Um, they, they, they're pretty fearsome. So they are, they are strong in their own right, but I don't think they're as strong as Satan. Okay. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up. Yes. Okay. First, who is the beast? Okay. Secondly, the beast was wounded. Yeah. From what? 
Okay. Good good questions. Okay. Thirdly, yeah. Okay, good questions. Uh, dealing in Revelation 13, we are introduced to a beast coming out of the sea, described as having seven heads, ten crowns on his horns, and ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on his horns, uh, which is very similar to the description of the dragon in chapter 12. So he's kind of a reflection of Satan. Um, I do believe that the beast referred to here and throughout the rest of Revelation is the same as the Antichrist. Okay, I do believe it's one and the same person. The word Antichrist does not appear in Revelation, but it does appear in John's letters. And John writes in his letters, you know that Antichrist, singular, is coming meaning in the future. Even now, many antichrists, plural, have come. So throughout history, and Jesus even said this, there will be many who claim to be me. There will be many false Christs. And we've seen them through history, right? You know, Napoleon thought he was Christ. Hitler thought he was Christ. You know, some of these religious cult leaders thought they were Christ or the Son of God or God or whatever. Um, so you see like these little miniature antichrists throughout history who, you know, want to rule the world and have all the, the power and the glory and all of that. But in the end, there's going to be one. There's going to be one that is the antichrist. He's the epitome. I cannot give chapter and verse on this, but I believe... I believe that this is going to be a human being that uh, Satan himself possesses. Usually when you hear of a demon-possessed person, it's a demon. Or demons like Legion we read about earlier. But if you'll remember, when Jesus was on earth, he was fully human, but he was God in the flesh. The Antichrist is to be Satan's counterfeit Jesus. So instead of being God in the flesh, I think it's going to be Satan in the flesh. I really do believe Satan is going to inhabit this person. If not, it's going to be one of Satan's most powerful demons that inhabits this person. And he is going to have great power. Now, you did mention... Uh, in Revelation 13, 3, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, and the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. I think the key in that ver verse is the words seemed to have had. All right? Now follow me. If Satan wants to recreate Jesus Christ, he's going to have him die and rise again, like Jesus did. But Satan doesn't have that power. Satan doesn't have the power to raise anyone from the dead. Only God does. So what I believe is going to happen is, it is going to appear that this person has been killed. And it appears, it seems that, um, in fact, I, I thought at one point, okay, later in chapter 13, it refers to the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. All right, so, so this isn't he got sick and died. This is he was killed. We would say he was assassinated. Okay. And... It's going to be made to look very real. And this person is dead, but on the third day, they're going to rise to life. Now, just for the sake of argument, I want you to imagine with me. November 22nd, 1963, 
President John F. Kennedy is gunned down in Dallas, Texas. He is dead. His body is flown back to Washington, D.C. His casket is put in the Capitol and hundreds of thousands of people come through and they see it. Could you imagine if on November 25th, 1963, that casket popped open and John Kennedy came out? What do you think his chances of re-election the next year would have been? Probably 100%, right? And remember this, he was even more popular overseas than he was here. He could have run for God and probably won, right? I mean, you just imagine if that had happened. And I believe that's what the Antichrist is going to be like. A lot of people think the Antichrist is going to be this hideous person that everybody hates. No. The Antichrist is going to be very charming, very attractive. He's probably going to get voted into whatever position he's in initially. I think he's going to be a very attractive, and I don't just mean physical looks, although it probably wouldn't hurt, but he's going to be a very positive kind of a, a person. He's going to get a positive response from the people. And then Satan comes in and elevates that popularity a hundredfold. And now he can say, you're going to worship me or else. You're going to do things my way or I'm going to kill you. And when those who are faithful to Christ say, uh, no, we're not doing that, he'll go after him. And one of the scariest verses, I think, is Revelation 13, 7. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. The Antichrist is going to be very successful in wiping out Christians that won't play by his rules. But I think before he gets all of the believers, Christ intervenes and takes them away. In fact, in uh, Matthew 24, I believe it is, Jesus says, unless the days had been shortened, no one would survive. But God's not going to allow that to happen. And that's why I believe in chapter 14, it talks about the harvest of the earth. You have the son of one that looks like the son of man coming on the clouds. There's a shout of the archangel, uh, the trumpet. This is all part of the seventh trumpet, by the way which I think 1 Corinthians calls the last trump. And the believers will be taken out. So Satan will not get his way. But for a while, it's going to be really bad to be a believer. Many of them are going to be killed for their faith. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But he offered God all these kingdoms. Yes. I mean, he had to have it. And he went back and forth. Uh huh. Yeah. The power had to be unbelievable. Right. So, yeah, and Satan does. Satan does have a lot of power. Um, he's certainly more powerful than we are in and of ourselves. He's more intelligent than we are. Uh, he's corrupted, so it's all kind of demented, but it's, he still has it. And here's an interesting thing. He offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, and Jesus refused. The Antichrist isn't. The Antichrist is going to take him up on that offer. And for a while, the Antichrist is going to rule all the kingdoms of the world to one degree or another. It's not perfect because eventually they're going to rise up in rebellion against him. But for a while, he's going to be king of the world. He's actually going to take Satan up on the offer that Jesus refused. So that, that you bring a good point there. That's a good point. Any other questions? Yes, Zoe. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. In fact, they, they appear at the end when they come back with Jesus. Um, 
that yes, they they will be. They they will spend eternity with Christ. When Jesus comes back, all believers. You, know, you go all the way back to Abel, <laughs> to the very moment when he returns. Everyone who has died with their faith in Christ, will be raised and given glorified bodies. Then those Christians who are still alive at that time, their bodies will be immediately changed into glorified bodies. And those are bodies that will never age, they will never get sick or injured, and they will never die. And that's how we will live forever in the presence of the Lord. But yes, there will be a time when the Antichrist will kill a lot of Christians. Yes, Linda. Correct. Ah, that's a very, very good question, and I'll be honest, I'm surprised it's taken this long to, to, for that to come up. We believe God does not make mistakes. I think we can all agree to that. So how did Satan get to where he was, you know? Did God know that this was going to happen? Well, yeah, pretty clear that he does. How could this be? You know, how could God create such a, an individual um, and remember this, God did not create Satan in his present form. When God created Satan, he was sinless. He was, as uh, I, when I say perfect, I don't mean in an ultimate sense like God is, but, but he, he, there, there was nothing evil about Lucifer when he was created. Just like Adam and Eve were morally innocent, so was Lucifer. God does not create evil. And God did not create Satan the way he is now. But he created Satan with the opportunity to choose. Which ought to sound a little bit familiar. Yes. The angels have will. And all of the angels had the choice of either staying loyal to God, or going off with Satan. Now, there is a question that I, that I honestly can't answer, and that is, do angels still have that choice? Can angels still revolt against God and get kicked out of heaven today? My thinking is, I don't believe so. I can't prove that. Uh, some might think that Genesis 6 where the sons of God saw the daughters of men and all of that mess, that maybe those were good angels at the time, but they chose to rebel and fell. Or were they part of the one-third that revolted with Satan? I don't know. I really don't. I, if I had to give an answer, I would say I think they're part of the one-third that revolted with Satan. But that's one I, I can't say. But it, it really strikes to... A very important question that a lot of people have and that is if God is so good and God is so great why is there evil why is there suffering why is there death why is that and the answer most people don't like but God decided that for his creatures to have the choice to follow him and to love him or to reject him and to rebel against him was more important than having a creation with no problems. God wanted his angels and he wants us to choose to love him. He could have created us all as robots with no choice, but he didn't. And he did so knowing that we would sin. He did so knowing Satan would rebel. Because that's part of his plan. People often ask, what's the point of the millennium? You know, Jesus is going to come and rule and reign on earth for a thousand years. But then he lets Satan out at the end. What is that all about? Why not just throw him into hell and leave him there? 
And again, it's part of God's plan. And it's God's way of showing that I can make things as humanly perfect as possible and you humans are still going to mess it up. You give Satan just a little bit of time and he's going to round up all these unbelievers and they're just going to, even though there's been perfect peace and prosperity and justice and all this great stuff for a thousand years, Satan gets a little opportunity and humans are going to run right after him. You say, why would you do that, God? Well, only God can really answer that, but it's all part of his plan. And through it all, he ultimately gets the glory, even in all of the hideous things Satan has done through the years, in all the horrible things humans have done to each other through the years, God will be glorified in the end. So ultimately, why did God create Satan? For his glory. Why did God create us? For his glory. Yes, he did. He did create us in his image, which is something the angels can't say. That's why I said it one other one time early in the series. Uh, there's a very popular conception that when humans die, they become angels. That would be a demotion. That's not a step up. It'd be a step down. Because angels are not created in the image of God. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews says, Jesus didn't die for the angels. Angels are not offered redemption. The angels who fell, they're done. They don't have an opportunity to repent. They have no opportunity to be saved. But human beings have. So we are actually a step above angels in God's way of looking at things. One day we will judge angels, according to 1 Corinthians 6. So. Very good. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do admit that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You've given us a glimpse into your plan. We know that you do all things for your glory. But we also admit that we don't have all the answers. That's why we trust in you. I thank you for what your word declares about our adversary, that we can be aware, we can be armed against his attacks. And I pray that this would not just be an academic exercise, but that we will take what we've learned and be able to use it in our day-to-day -day lives. So go with us now. Help us to be victorious over the enemy that you've already defeated. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.